Church family, how are we doing today? Let's stand to our feet this morning and sing together the hope of resurrection life today. Come on, here we go. Where was the darkness when hope was restored? Where was despair when my God split the shores? Where was defeat when the Lord took a breath? When he stood in power by the grave that he left. Nowhere, 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 nowhere is the fear when my King resurrects. Nowhere, 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 nowhere was the doubt when my King conquered death. The stronghold of sin by the grace he possessed. Nowhere, 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 nowhere is the fear when my king resurrects. Nowhere, 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 nowhere was the doubt when my king conquered death.
God of revival, pour it out, pour it
Let's pray together, church. Uh, Father, we thank you for uh, your love this morning and uh, the promise that uh, nothing can separate us from that love, uh, the love that was displayed on that cross for us, uh, that blood was shed and your body was torn for us, Father. Uh, and you rose again three days later in the conquering the suffering of this world and that we have the hope that we will be with you again. We thank you for that promise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and check out our announcements for this week. Good morning! Thanks for being here with us today. Before we get back to the rest of our morning, we've got a few reminders for you. This Saturday, March 25th, is the Women's Ministry Coffee Chats. Ladies will meet at 9 a.m. at Atlas Coffee in Sterling Ranch to spend a couple hours hanging out together, building friendships. Easter weekend at Valley View is just three weeks away, and we've got the full rundown for you. The weekend will start off with a Good Friday service on Friday, April 7th at 6 p.m. There will be opportunities for adults and kids to participate in age-appropriate ways. That's right. Our Good Friday service will be a traditional, somber, and reflective time as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And our kids' ministry team is planning a Good Friday experience for kids in preschool through fifth grade. Saturday, April 8th, we'll have our first Easter service at 4 p.m. Our Easter services will be a true celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Following the 4 p.m. service on Saturday is our annual family egg hunt. There will be food, egg hunts, bounce houses, games, and a petting zoo. And finally, Sunday, April 9th, we will have Easter services at our normal times of 9 and 10.30 a.m. Make plans to join us for this Easter experience. And most importantly, bring someone with you. Easter weekend is an incredible time to invite a friend to church with you. Their life might just be changed forever. You can check out all of the details for Easter weekend right on our website, valleyviewcc.com. Guys, the spring flag football season is starting up on Sunday, April 16th. If you want to join the team, head to valleyviewcc.com slash athletics. That's all for us. Bye! Bye. Hey, Valley View, good to see you this morning. Um, that is so much happening here at the church, and uh, thrilled, to, thrilled to do as much of it with you as we possibly can. Um, if you're new with our church, my name's Phil, and uh, anyway, hope to meet you sometime. After our service, we got a thing called Valley View in 5. We'd love to connect with you there. I just learned a little bit more about the church and received a gift from us, uh, but also, again, just find out ways to maybe take a next step here, get some of your questions answered that you might have again, about our church. Now, I got a couple things to run past you, and here in a moment, we'll have a time of offering. Uh, one of those things is, you know, what we have found as, as our church is, uh, you know, just great things going on with the kids, and um, great things happening all over, but uh, between services, there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of excitement from the kids to get a donut. Uh, and so, with that, some of the kids are running, whatnot, and just say all that to say, last week we had a little bit of an accident. We had an accident. Uh, one of the kids ran into somebody. And um, uh, anyway, so we want to try to try to rein a little of that in. So we know kids are going to be kids, and we know this is going to be the kind of place where kids get excited. And if we have to buy a few extra donuts to make sure that they know they'll get one, we might do that. We might have to do that. But that's all good. At any rate, just uh, try to keep an eye on your kiddos and just say, hey, you know, we can walk fast to, to get the donut, something like that. Anyhow, having said that, though, uh, speaking of the kids, you, so many of you contributed to our scholarship fund uh, just over the last past month, and we appreciate that because that fund is going to help kids go to camp. It's even going to help offset some costs on some mission trip uh, expenses that we have coming up, and, and so we're thrilled for all of that uh, with all the kids we have coming in. So through your contributions, um, we had $9,732 given, Just so, so thank you for that. Um, that is a lot of kids that are going to get blessed, and, and even, you know, some adults along the way. And so thank you for your generosity. Um, and then all of that also leads into what we have coming up in just a couple weeks, which is Easter weekend. And so we're, we're thrilled for Easter weekend here at, at Valley View, and, and you know, we're trying to provide as much as we possibly can for you. But we got a great Good Friday service that's going to be planned, as was said there. And, and then we have a lot of activities as well. You can pick up these cards on the way out. This is a, a two-fold card. It is a reminder card. Uh, for what's coming up and what we have happen on Easter weekend, but it's also an invite card. Invite somebody out. 
uh, to our Easter services. Uh, we, we'd love to have you bring in people. That's one of the times when people are just most open to receiving an invitation, and we want people to learn about Jesus, no matter what background, no matter where it is they came from. I mean, just this past week, I was talking with a woman, and, and uh, she was asking me what I did, and I told her I'm a pastor for church, and then she's asking what church, and she was a little bit interested, and so I kind of dove in a little further, and I was like, oh, well, do you, you know, we'd love to have you come sometime. Here's a, here's a card, and, and she said, I'm Jewish. Well, Jesus is Jewish, so if you want to learn more about Jesus, come on out. I mean, it's, at any rate, get an invite out there. I, I, people, she, she was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, any, so good, we'd love to have you get some invites out for Easter and uh, just have some more families and people experience uh, the love of God. Uh, that's fine, found in Christ. Now, having said all that, I'm thrilled that you're with me today, or thrilled with our church. Um, I'm not actually preaching today. We got David Postier preaching, so he's got an awesome message. We're thrilled for that. And then you also have an amazing story that you're going to hear later on, uh, at the end of the, just at the end of his message that I cannot wait for you to hear. It is a is an incredible, it's just an incredible story. So I can't wait for that. But anyway, come on up, David, wherever you're at, and uh, give David a warm welcome. All right. Well, good morning, church. Good to see you guys. Uh, I've got your Bibles with you. We're going to be in Job chapter 30 today. Job chapter 30. Well, some of you know this about me. Big history nerd, and so I wanted to share a story with you from recent American history uh, to introduce our text this morning. In late October 1991, a warm weather storm system made its way across the Atlantic Ocean and developed into a category, category 2 hurricane that was eventually named Grace. Well, eventually, Hurricane Grace weakened in strength and actually turned north and made its way up the Atlantic Ocean. Now, at the same time that this was happening, a very large area of low pressure, known as a nor'easter, had began to develop off the coast of Nova Scotia in Canada and caused some coastal flooding, high winds, other storm-related things, and it made its way out into the ocean, where it actually intersected with Hurricane Grace to become an even bigger storm. Now, according to meteorologists, these two storms colliding out over open water by itself wouldn't really have presented that much of a threat to anybody. But the added challenge was that at the same exact time that was happening, there was a very large area of high pressure from the, coming down from the Arctic north and east that also intersected with these other two storms and pushed the entire new hurricane system back towards the coastline where it would go on to cause over $200 million in damages and even take the lives of 13 individuals. These kind of rare circumstances of three separate storms coming together so late in the season and so far north in the Atlantic Ocean led meteorologists to refer to this weather phenomena as the perfect storm a set of incredibly rare sets of circumstances that just so happened to come together at the same time to wreak havoc on everything around it. And of course, the reality for all of us is that we too experience perfect storms in our lives where separate, random, rare sets of circ circumstances just so happen to come together to form a perfect storm in our life that wreaks havoc on everything around us and also causes lots of damages. You know, I don't think it would take me long if I were to go around the room and start talking to each of you before I would hear some incredibly tragic stories of storms that you faced in your life, something related to financial struggles, marital issues that you're facing, Maybe you lost a job or somebody close to you died or you're dealing with rebellious kids or the insurance company isn't cooperating with the claim that you put in. The list would go on and on and on. And so the question for all of us this morning in here is this. When these perfect storms come in life, what are we supposed to do? In other words, what is it that God is wanting to teach us and what does he want us to believe when we're in a season of perfect storms? And so with that in mind, we're going to be Job chapter 30 this morning, starting in verse 15. Now, if you're just joining us for the first time or you're not familiar with the uh, book of Job, a little bit of review for you. The story of Job is essentially the story of God allowing Satan to wreak havoc on a man named Job's life who is very righteous in order to test 
his faith. Satan essentially challenges God, says, hey, he's only a righteous guy because he's got a pretty easy life. And so God allows Satan to bring some tragedies into Job's life in order for him to have his faith tested. God puts one caveat on there. He says, you're not allowed to take his life. Now, when you read the story of Job, at first, it really actually doesn't seem all that bad. At first, the only thing that he loses were his oxen and his donkeys. But then you read further in the text, you find out he also loses his sheep. And then you read on, he also loses his camels, and then all of his servants get taken away, and then his kids actually die in an accident in their house, and then to make it all worse, Satan attacks Job's health, and he's inflicted with boils and sores, and really to put the cherry on top, Satan and the bad guys in the story allow Job's wife to live, because essentially they're like, dude, she's so bad, we thought she was on our side. <laughs> we thought she was she would do more damage in your life by staying in there because Job's wife, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, one verse in the entire Bible, and in that verse she says this, curse God and die. What a wonderful woman to be married to. I'm sure those were some real fun conversations, and so one thing after another builds up in Job's life, and then he's left with irritating and irksome people, and it all comes together as a perfect storm. And so the rest of this, the book of Job is essentially this conversation between Job and his friends and gods as they very poetically describe the reality of the situation that he's facing. And so with all that going on, Job just lets all of his emotions out there and is honest before God. And we're going to read part of his response here this morning. Job chapter 30, verse 15, if you're following along. It says this. This is Job speaking here. Terrors are turned loose against me. They chase my dignity away like the wind. My prosperity has passed by like a cloud. Now my life is poured out before me, and days of suffering have seized me. Night pierces my bones, but my nine pains never rest. My clothing is distorted with great force. He chokes me by the neck of my garment. He throws me into the mud, and I have become like dust and ashes. I cry out to you for help. But you do not answer me. When I stand up, you merely look at me. You have turned against me with cruelty. You harass me with your strong hand. You lift me up on the wind and make me ride it. And you scatter me in the storm. So Job's looking at this entire situation that he's dealing with, all the pain, all the suffering, and he describes it using the imagery of a storm. Terrors are turned loose against me. They chase my dignity away like the wind. My prosperity pass by like a cloud. You lift me up on the wind and you scatter me in the storm. Now, let me tell you something. My wife and I have lived here in the state of Colorado for seven years now, actually, this month. And we love Colorado. Colorado is awesome, has so many wonderful things that we love. Hiking, fishing, mountains a professional baseball team that sucks, but I still watch them every single year because I love them, right? All kinds of great stuff. Let me tell you something that you don't have in this state, okay? What you guys do not have in this state are really good, powerful thunderstorms, all right? That's right, I got an amen there. The thunderstorms in this state kind of just trickle over the mountains and then the wind dissipates them and they brush here and there and then they kind of move on before they, they build in strength. Is anybody here originally from the Midwest or the Great Plains? Yeah, that's right, that's right. So all you Colorado natives, those people that just put their hands in the air, they know what a real thunderstorm is, all right? I'm talking about that kind of storm. You're sitting at my parents' house on the porch. You can see it on the horizon. You watch it develop and grow in strength for hours. It's enormous, it's strong, and then it hits you. And the rain pours down constantly all day long. There's lightning from one side of the sky to the other nonstop. The thunder is so loud, you can literally feel it in your skin. That's a real thunderstorm. That's the kind of storm that Job is describing here in this text. It is raging at him. It is pounding at him, and it's not going to stop. So he lets all of his emotions out there, and he says this. He cries out to God for help, but he doesn't answer him. Can I just ask, has anybody ever cried out to God and not gotten an answer before? That's right. Common story happens to all of us. Big fisherman right here, if I had a dollar for every time I prayed to the Lord of the harvest to help me catch a fish, church, I'd be able to replace all the carpet in this building with marble flooring, all right? We cry out to God for help, but he doesn't 
answer us. We don't have time to dissect that entire idea, but I think one hard truth that we need to learn within that is that from God's perspective, a perfectly acceptable answer to some of our prayers are either the words no or not yet. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later, but let me give you a little bit of an insight here for this. These perfect storm, this perfect storm that Job had to deal with is something that actually a lot of characters in the Bible, some of the most well-known, incredible characters in the Bible also had to deal with, okay? Listen to this. Joseph, sold by his brothers, betrayed by his employer's wife, stuck in a prison cell that he didn't deserve. King David, the youngest of eight sons, ridiculed by his brothers, lost his best friend in battle, mocked by his own wife, wild accusations made against him, lived as a fugitive for years. Fast forward to the New Testament. The Apostle Paul and his missionary journeys have been beaten, chased, arrested, scourged, cane, whipped, imprisoned, denied justice, and eventually shipwrecked and put on house arrest. Church, if perfect storms were inevitable realities for some of the most well-known characters in the Bible, we shouldn't be surprised when the same things come into our life. So what are we supposed to do then? What are we supposed to do in those perfect storms? Well, to tie back into that question that we asked earlier, if you look closely at Job's response, what is he doing with God? He's being perfectly honest about what it is that he's experiencing. He's laying it out there and giving very honest thoughts about what he's experiencing. The text never tells us that God comes in and tells him to shut up or that he shouldn't have said anything or anything like that. We're gonna look at God's response in a little bit and see, see some of the strong language he uses. But what God does here, like a good compassionate father, is that he simply listens to his kids as they describe to him what they're feeling. And so let me bring this home for you right now, okay? Maybe for you that means you have recently lost a job And you need to admit to God that you're scared for your future and you don't know how you're going to provide for your family. Maybe you are dealing with some marital strife or some other relational challenge and you need to admit to God that you are scared and how you don't want to be alone in the future. You're surprised that things are where they're at now. Maybe somebody close to you in your life recently passed away and you you need to admit to God that you're mad that that happened sooner than you ever thought that it would. Or maybe you're dealing with some health crisis, some bad news that you got from a doctor, and you need to just admit to God that you're scared for your future and you don't have enough strength to face what's before you. Whatever your particular situation is, church, be honest with the Lord. Let it out there and know that like a good, compassionate father, he's going to listen to what you have to say. And so that's what we see is the first part of Job's response here. We get this idea of full honesty from Job. Now, we don't have time to look at all of Job's response, but if we were, what you would notice and see is that Job, in his honesty, eventually went a little bit too far. He went too far in his honesty and almost got to the point, the idea is that he like challenged God and essentially like telling God he's wrong for allowing that stuff to happen. And so he crosses that line, and then God gets a chance to respond to that perspective from Job. Now, we're going to jump over to Job chapter 40, but to uh, set the stage for Job chapter 40, I'm going to stop real quick in Job 38, because in Job 38, this is the first time that God talks in the book of Job since this stuff has gotten started. Chapter 38, the book of Job is only 42 chapters long, so that gives you an idea right there of how long God just patiently listened and waited. And so God comes in here, and his response at first seems pretty harsh. But what I hope to show you today is that it's actually actually an incredible response on God's part to meet us where we're at. Okay, so this is Job 38, verses 3 to 7, setting the stage for God's response to Job later, right? So it says this, chapter 38, verse 3. God says, get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding, who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? What supports its foundations? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang for joy and all the sons of God uh, shouted for joy? All right? Now, 
I don't personally know like what God feels necessarily in these kind of situations as he's watching Job and his friends, but I'd like to think it's a little bit how I, I see my toddlers interact with one another and with me, especially when they're like trying to convince me to, uh, to do something or to not do something or give them something, right? So here, here's a quick example from, from our life, okay? So in our household, I have three kids, four, two, and zero, we do not let them watch TV on Mondays, Wednesdays, or Fridays, just trying to limit that. And so what that forces them to do is to get creative with how they spend their time and play. And so they come up with some cool things and fun games and <laughs> whatever strange boyish reason, I've got three boys, um, they like to play with water, specifically a lot of running water. And so what they will do is go to our bathroom sinks and they will turn on the water while it's running a little bit. They'll go grab all their toys and they'll like play in the water, like waterfalls, washing it off, all kinds of fun stuff, right? And so as the father in this situation, I'm like standing back off to the side. I'm, have, I'm having this like internal battle with me because like half of me is going, this is so cute. They're doing it. They're getting creative. They're, they're finding a way to spend the time. And the other half of me is like, that is literal money going down the drain. Like all I see is a water bill going up and up and up. So what do I have to do? Well, eventually as the dad, I step into this situation. And I say, all right, boys, time for us to shut the water off. No, 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 dad, five more minutes. I think we can afford five more minutes, kid. Like, we got to shut this thing off. No, oh, come on, dad, like, like just, just a little bit longer, a few more toys. I said, no, we need to shut it off now. And then I start having to, like, explain how this costs money, which you can't explain that to a toddler, right? And so Benjamin, and my oldest, kind of starts to get a little bit more interactive with me. And he's like, well, I'll pay for it, Dad. I got my piggy bank in my room. I'm like, this is not the point, kid, right? So I'm trying to then respond in the same way that God does Job here. I'm like, oh, you'll pay for it, will you? Well, what job do you have? What do you do for a living? Where were you when I bought this house, right? Who supports the foundations of this family, right? So I think that's kind of the idea that's going on here. But what's the point I'm trying to make in this story? What's this, Okay. I, as the authoritative figure in that situation, I can see things, I can understand things, I have my reasons for doing things that they cannot understand, and I need them to obey, and get this, trust me. Even when they don't like that answer, even when they can't understand why, church, it's the same thing with God. He's the authoritative figure in our life, and he can see things, he knows things, he has his reasons for doing so, even if we don't like that answer, even if it doesn't make sense. But God wants us to still obey him and get this trust him as well. So what God is getting frustrated with Job in this text is not the fact that he was honest. We just looked at how God patiently listened and allowed him to be honest. What God got frustrated with Job at was his lack of faith. He crossed a line where he stopped trusting God in the midst of that storm. So I'm going to say it like this, okay? This is how I want you to remember it. God wants us to be honest in our suffering, but not hopeless. God wants us to be honest in our suffering, but not hopeless as we do so. And still trust him through all of those things. And so God says all of that. And then we can get to Job chapter 40, where a similar response on God's part happens before Job himself responds. So with God keeping that idea in mind of, of us wanting to trust him, to submit to his authority, his status in the situation, comes back to Job in chapter 40 and says this, the Lord answered Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. Then Job answered the Lord, I am so insignificant. How can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not reply. Twice, but now I can add nothing. And so God's response like that goes on for a couple of other um, chapters, but he gives Job this chance to respond real quick. And in a sense, he kind of gets, he's like, all right, I recognize I crossed that line. I recognize I went a little bit too far. And then God responds this way. And this, this is huge, church. Okay, this is big. Verse 6 of chapter 40. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. Would you really challenge my justice? Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can you thunder with a voice like his? And God responds in similar language for another couple of chapters, which we don't have time to cover, all right? 
A quick little side note, okay, we're getting into some language here. Verse 7, God says this, get ready to answer me like a man. Some of your translations might say something like, brace yourself or uh, dress yourself for action, all right? Literally in Hebrew, this would be translated as gird your loins like a man. So men in the room, let me ask you, when was the last time you girded your loins? Huh? Like, when was the last time you did that? Actually, why don't you stand up for a second, man? I want you to grab your loins for a second. Stand up. All right, nobody jumped at that good. <laughs> Some of you still trying to figure out where your loins are at. <clears throat> you can ask your wife when you get home on that one. So, all right, what's the, <laughs> what's the idea that's going on here, okay? This Hebrew phrase is the idea of getting ready for some physical work or labor or even some warfare, right? It kind of carries the modern sense of let's roll these sleeves up, buckle up, let's get down to business, all right? So God is, God is telling Job, listen, you need to brace yourself because this thing isn't over yet. Look at some of the language that God uses in this passage. Really interesting. The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Would you really inform me? Challenge my justice. Declare me guilty. And then get this, verse 9. Can you thunder with a voice like his? What's God doing here? He's picking up on the same storm imagery that Job himself used back in chapter 30. Because here's the thing. This storm that Job is facing is not over yet. It's still going on. Even as God responded and even as Job recognizes he maybe went a little bit too far, the storm is still going on. Okay, that loss is still real for Job. The pain is still tangible. The, the grief is gut-wrenching. It hasn't ended yet. It's ongoing right now. And God's saying, brace yourself because this thing is not over. But there's a, there's a clue in God's response that really helps us understand what it is that we're supposed to do in these perfect storms. Look at verse 6, all right? Verse 6, and somebody answer me this question. Where does God answer Job from? From the storm. From the whirlwind, the text tells us, okay? Do you get this, church? God has not moved on from the storm. He's not outside of the storm. He's not trying to play catch up. He's right there in the midst of the storm with Job as it's going on and as it continues going on. And he's saying, I need you to trust me. I am here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm right in the midst of it all with you. And I need you to trust me through it all. Because God did not abandon Job in the storm. This is the big idea I want you to keep in mind. You forget everything else I say this morning, that's fine. I don't even care. Remember this right here. God allowed the storm to happen, but he did not abandon Job within. God allowed that storm to happen, but he did not abandon Job within. God was not the one who caused these things to happen. That was Satan. But God in his authoritative role and his wisdom and his knowledge allowed it to happen and yet did not abandon Job within the storm. Deuteronomy 31.6 promises us, God promises his people to not be afraid of what's in front of you because he will never leave you nor abandon you. God allows the storm to happen, but he does not abandon us within so God's response goes on for a couple of chapters, and then we pick it up in chapter 42, where Job gets a chance to respond one more time. And so this is Job chapter 42, starting in verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things that I did not Understand things too wondrous for me to know. You said, Listen now, and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard reports about you, Job says, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I reject my words and am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. So Job finally gets it now. We might say he knew about God before, but now he really knows. God. He's crossed back across that line, if you will, to the realm of faith. He went from being faithless to being faithful. He went from being full of doubt to being full of faith, and he finally gets it, and he surrenders himself to the Lord once again. That phrase there, I reject my words and I am sorry for them. Literally in Hebrews, I reject and I relent. It's the same word used elsewhere in Scripture for the word repentance. 
So Job is repenting from his perspective, from his lack of faith, his doubt, and saying that I now fully understand that my role in this and I'm submitting to God. So he came to believe that God allowed that storm to happen, but that he did not abandon Job within. But remember, church, that storm is still going on as Job says those things. It is still real. He still has a lot of questions. He might be wondering why this had to happen. And yet in the midst of that, he recognized that needed to happen in order to perfect his faith in God. And so he fully surrenders to God and trusts that he allows those things to happen, but he never abandons him with it. And I wonder if that's what you're dealing with as well. Whether your perfect storm is something that happened distant in the past or something recent, or maybe something that's happening right now in this season, that storm is still real, the pain is still tangible, the loss gut-wrenching, you still have questions, you're wondering why, and yet you have the opportunity to ask yourself if you've ever surrendered to God in general or for that specific thing, fully surrendering that to him and coming to believe that God allows things to happen but never abandons you within those things. Because here's the thing, church, that perfect storm that you're facing might just be the thing that God is using to perfect your faith in him and to cross back in that line, just like the story of Job. So we all have an opportunity to come to believe God allows storms to happen but never abandons us within. That's what Job had to come to believe. That's what all of us have to come to believe. And that's what a man named Greg Cruzy right here in our church had to come believe as well. Greg's been a part of our church for the last seven or eight months. And through a set of incredibly rare and unfortunate circumstances that just happened to come together for a perfect storm in his life, he came to believe that God allows storms to happen, but that he never abandons you within these storms. So I want you to check out Greg's story and see how God never abandons us. Hello everyone, my name is Greg Cruzy. I am 22 years old. I am from Missouri. I first got connected here at Valley View Gene. He happens to be friends with the pastor that I had back home in Missouri. I was a bowler early on in life. I was actually pretty good at it. Um, I was a soccer player. I played up through my junior year in high school. I had plans that I wanted to be an airline pilot after my first time of ever being on a plane. Whenever I was in seventh grade, I believe, you know, I just thought I could live life my own way. I thought I had my own path, and I thought I was doing pretty good at it. I was working for UPS, and I had plans to one day fly for them. And so June 9th, that day, I get out of work, I walk across the street, get in my car, and I just jumped in, started it up, and started driving. I saw a car coming head on at me in my lane. I just remember seeing him come head on at me like this. I thought we were gonna hit full on head on. And at the last second, I remember watching him swerve, and then we hit like this, driver corner, driver corner. And then I blacked out. I woke up uh, on the ground, you know, not really sure what's going on. I ended up waking up the next day in the hospital and I couldn't see. That was the biggest turning point for me that I had to stop and realize, clearly I've been living life the wrong way. You know, I was trying to live it my own way. Figuratively speaking, my eyes were opened at that point uh, for me to see that, you know, I need to straighten myself out. You know, I gotta, I gotta go to the Lord and see how he wants me to live. One of the first things I, I said to my mom after that was, I guess it's, it's better to be blind and alive than dead. If there's something we gotta be grateful for, A, it's, a, it's the Lord, but B, you know, so what if you lose your eyesight, you know? Um, life's not over because you lost know, your eyesight. I'm alive. I, I survived. My freedom was gone. I couldn't just go get in the car and drive and go somewhere anymore. I had to, I had to accept reality of this is my life. We've all gone through some hard times and there's days that it's still rough and you know, we're all gonna go through that, but you just gotta ask yourself, you know, 
what can I do to push through it? If that means you got to sit there and say a prayer, I don't care how many you got to say, you know, we all might feel like the Lord isn't answering or maybe he's ignoring us. I asked the same thing, why, why did I have to go blind? Out of all things that could have happened, like I would almost have taken anything else over being blind. I, I might not get an answer in my time of being here still of why I went blind. My blind life is my best life, and that's very honest, sincere statement out of me. Is you know I've I've been living life a lot better, not being able to see. Um, you know I've been able to open my ears a little more and pay attention to what the Lord's saying and not what I'm thinking. We've all heard the line, we walk by faith and not by sight. As a blind person myself, and a few others that I know of at, at the school with me, is they'll tell you the same thing, is you don't need sight. Walk by what God has to show you. Walk his path. You know, it, it took two decades and losing my eyesight and being in a really bad car wreck uh, for me to get myself to come closer with the Lord. My uh, grandma, uh, she was attending the church um, that John, uh, Jean's friend, uh, is the pastor at. She was telling me that the youth pastor there, Sean, he, um, you know, he would have just loved to reach out and connect with me. Sean ended up coming over to my house. He said, where do you stand? I said, I, I can definitely say that I've waken up a bit more, but I said, I kind of still feel like sort of still in the middle here. I said, I know that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think. I'm going to have to go with what the Lord wants, and that's for me to come closer to him. After having that conversation, uh, he's like, well, there's no better time than to start right now, is there? And I said, well, <laughs> I guess you're right. I guess I can't sit here and argue that one. We ended up setting up a date. I think it was about a month later. I think it was in September of 21, whenever I got baptized. Getting baptized, you know, um, it's just the best feeling that you can possibly have. And we've all been told in the Bible is God's going to use all things for good. Not some, but all. That's right. Praise the Lord. All things together for good. Well, Greg, well, you're, you're I'm the head of the game here, bro. Come on up, my man. All right, you got it. All right, right this way, dude. So I'll give you a little insight into Greg's personality. Um, a little over a month ago when I asked him if he would be willing to come in and make the video, I asked him if he'd be willing to speak in front of the church afterwards, share things. Do you remember what you said? Uh, do I remember what I said? Yeah. Yes, it would be my honor to do so. I well, that was the right okay, answer. that's not the right answer. But I'm glad that I'm glad that you said I said, are, are you comfortable coming up in front of people to speak? And he goes, well, it's not like I can see them or anything. So I can be embarrassed, so got a little uh, comedy uh, at heart here. So, Greg, thank you so much for sharing your story, but more importantly, thank you for responding to the call that God had on your life. Um, you're almost two years into this new life now that you're living. Why don't you share with us just a bit about what that's been like and what you feel like the Lord is teaching you right now in this season? Thank you. 
than yeah. everyone else. That's awesome, man. Well, you're, you're in a room full of almost everybody that is not blind. We can see. What is something that you would like to share with us, something that we can all learn about how to interact with you guys, help you guys out, learn from you, whatever that might be? You know, I think I, I always like to say the biggest thing is just ask, um, you know, but don't make assumptions, you know, feel free to talk to us just because we're blind. You know, life might be a little bit harder for us, and the big thing is, you know, we're all going to face a challenge. You guys might have something else going on. We got we got blindness to deal with, and you know, even for us, you know, we all say it that somebody else has it worse, mm. and it might be hard to believe for us blind people, but you know, there is somebody else out there mm. that does have it worse. And you know, the biggest question um, that it got brought to my attention last Sunday back home, uh, I went and talked with uh, the senior pastor, John. And him and I, we were just sitting there talking about, you know, about life and stuff. And he goes, Greg, you know, we, a lot of us here know what you have gone through, but, you know, we're all, we're all asking the wrong question. You know, we're all sitting here asking why, you know, why did I go blind? Why did, you know, why did we have to get divorced? Why did this have to happen? You know, um, but really the bigger question is what? And, you know, I kind of didn't understand at first. I was like, okay. And then, uh, you know, he explained, he said, well, the question we need to be asking is, what will we let the Lord do for us? Mm. And, you know, I didn't really think about that one at all. And then, you know, ever since he said that, and as I was sitting here the whole time, that question came to my mind. And that's something for all you guys to think about as well, is what will we let the Lord do for us? Mm. That's a great question, Greg. Hey, thanks for sharing. Let's give uh, Greg another hand, guys. Greg, you can head back this way. I'm glad that you got that microphone. You need to stand the right side there. Hey, church, Greg, um, Greg and his family are going to be on the lobby. We set up a table and some chairs there for him. So if you guys want to stop by, say hi, say thank you, ask a question, encourage him, whatever that is. He's going to be here all morning, uh, after and in between services. So. Thank you guys for being here. I hope that you come to believe in whatever storm you're facing, that God allows things like that to happen, but he's never gonna abandon you within those storms. You guys go ahead, stand. Our worship team will lead us in one final song, and we'll conclude our service. Yeah, praise God. Let's respond to this incredible story of God's faithfulness in our song today. I'm fighting a battle You've already won And no matter what comes my way I will overcome Don't know what you're doing But I know what you've done I'm fighting a battle
fix my eyes on Jesus Christ, I'll say that it is well. Oh, I know that it today church morning together. Amen, church. So good. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us today at Valley View, and we're so glad you decided to join us for worship. And uh, if you're new here, uh, we would like to get you plugged into Valley View in five right out here in our connections desk. That's your next step and uh, getting plugged in here. So make sure you go check that out. Uh, but you guys take care of each other. Okay. Whatever you're going through, I don't know what you're going through. Um, stick it out. God is faithful. Okay. Praise God. You guys have a great week, and we'll see you next week.